Imagine that you are a security analyst for a large bank. Your job is to keep bad things out and make sure sensitive things stay in. So it strikes you as odd that one day you notice a large amount of traffic going out to a website. The website's name is paulsemporium.com. You look into this website, paulsemporium.com, and notice that it's owned by one Paul Allen. Now, Paul Allen is an employee at the bank you work at. He works in mergers and acquisitions, and he also happens to be your friend. You two get lunch together every day, and it almost being lunchtime, you think it's a good time to ask Paul about this odd traffic. At lunch, you two talk about business cars, other fun things that have to do with the bank. I don't know. Until you finally bring up the traffic. So, what's all this traffic going out, Paul? You ask. He laughs it off and says, oh yeah, in my downtime, I upload old home videotapes to my personal website. I do it every day. It's nothing to worry about. Well, that explains it, I guess. Boring, but it explains it. So after lunch, you go back to your desk. You still see the odd traffic, but you, you brush it off. He's your friend. You, you trust him. So weeks go by. You see this traffic almost daily, but hey, it's just Paul. He's just uploading those videotapes, right? Nothing wrong. Several, day late, several days later, Paul quits. You lost a friend and you're disappointed, but hey, the traffic finally stops. Now nothing on the network seems odd. However, a few days later, your boss runs into the office and says, oh, we have an issue. We've, we've been breached. You ask what it means because you didn't see anything on your side. You're the, you're the best goddamn security analyst around. Stuff that shouldn't be leaked, he says. It's been leaking for weeks and now a planned merger is off. We just lost millions. You begin to panic. What, what could have gone wrong? You ask your boss to send the information over that was leaked. He gives it to you and you, you start searching for evidence of it leaving the network. And you find it. It, it was going to paulsemporium.com for weeks. God damn it, Paul Allen. Today's episode is a discussion about insider threat, more specifically insider flight risk. You can have the best defenses in the industry, but all it takes is one person on the inside to ruin it all. My name is Paul, and with me today is Adam and Mark, and this is the ThreatCast. Hello, everyone. With me today is Adam Blake. Adam. Hello. This is Adam. How are, how are you doing today? I'm doing swimmingly. Swimmingly. Okay. Also with me is Mark Grasso. Hello, Mark. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. I wanted to ask you the same question. Well, too bad I beat you to it. God damn it. So let's kick this <laughs> off. Adam, why don't you get us started? Sure. So today we're focusing on flight risk, um, which is a type of insider threat. Um, with fun with flight risk on this here website, uh, the we will cover different types of of uh, insider threat. One of them being flight risk, and that is defined as people who are planning on, on leaving, sending data home. Um, this should be differentiated from malicious um, insider threats, so technical insiders or people who want to leak stuff for you know personal or political gain. Um, these are people who are just leaving. Um, so there are many different types, um, and we're going to break this out like we do in the article that you can click on um, into motivations and how companies today combat insiders and detection logic and use cases to identify them. Uh, typically, the motivations for flight risk are you know people who are leaving or people who are think they're about to get fired, um, so they don't. Install malware, typically. Okay, so you have the motivations that they might be leaving or they might get fired. What What is their motivation for leave? Like, what do they? why would they want to release stuff if they're leaving? Why would they want to release stuff if they're fired? What, what is their gain out of it? So a lot of the gain is people's worked, you know, multiple years at the Wing Dating Factory, and they want to take home their work that they did at the Wing Dating Factory, number one, because people feel a sense of pride in their work, or it's going to help them with their next job, or it's part of their portfolio. Um, so the example that I gave in the article is like a uh, graphics designer, where all of their work is made up of their portfolio, which for the last three years, all they've done was work for the company that they're leaving. Um, so they want to take that with them. Same thing would happen with like code generators, so people writing code don't want to rewrite the same code for the next place, which is probably what they're going to end up doing. 
So they try to take it with them. Um, and they typically take the most innocuous ways possible until that proves unavailable. And then they get a little sneaky, but the anyone is possible for a fight with, so it's not just technical people. Um, so I wouldn't expect someone to stand up their own server and then, you know, VPN into their own server to try to send data home. That's when we start getting control of ones later. How do you determine whether or not that stuff is bad? Like, if, if I went on threatfix.com today and just while at work and I started just uploading Ooh, nice, stuff. Nice plug, by the no, way. No, 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 shh, 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 quiet. You should probably go to the website. Um, so how would I determine if that's bad? Like, you, you can't, right? You're just kind of just finding the outliers and then you have to dig deeper. But how deep do you go? Uh, you know, as, as deep as you can. Like, so the, the idea is um, identifying personal domains, right? So like in your example, Paul Allen goes to paulallen.com. That's obviously a personal domain. And so more, more investigation should be done because that's not normal company policy. Um, we expect people to go to websites for their work. We expect people to go to websites instead of working. Both of these are generally okay for the insider threat analyst. Um, but what you need to be able to differentiate is normal traffic and uploads. Uploads are your enemy, and normal traffic is uh, probably okay, but maybe not. Um, so if you identify that it's their personal domain, you absolutely have to look at it deeper. Um, if you look at the ratio, and it's clearly an upload, you want to identify that as well. Um, if the domain's been stood up in the last six months, that's risky. You look at the categories, um, there are a myriad of ways. And we get into that in the article. So I might be way out of scope of what you're talking about or your article's about, but um, how would you associate the flight risk with, you know, maybe they're not uploading to their own server, but they're copying everything to their own USB. Sure. And they're taking all their data that way. So what, what is your opinion on, you know, how finding that information out versus being able to just look in traffic logs to find all the proxy traffic? Right. So um, most of the organizations that I've, I've been um, and that I'm aware of have USB rights blocked just as a rule. Um, so you'd have to get an exception to right. If you do have an exception to right, that's going to be a smaller subset of the population. And you would have a general baseline of what's normal for them to write. So um, they usually have to have a business case for what to write. So they'll say, I need to write the you know, quarterly summaries to a USB drive. And then I walk it down the hall to the next company and hand it to them for tax reasons. right? And so as soon as they start putting PDFs on there, it's risky. So any deviation from the norm. I mean, you can block USB, right? But yep. you, you might not be able to block webmail. You might not be able to block just sending stuff from your email you're just you're just covering one section there's going to be other ways to drop stuff out how how can you make sure that blocking usb which is a hassle um to the end user how can you be sure that they're just not going to find a different way yeah so they're actually going to find a different way it's, it's exactly similar to you know smoking out a rat right so you don't want to let the smart smoke fly until you make sure you've covered all the exits otherwise they're just going to go somewhere else um, so typically you'll block the risky domains in proxy. Um, you'll monitor for people sending data home, which could be interesting. Um, it'd be interesting anyways, even if it's not a flight risk. Um, but identifying somebody as a flight risk is the first step. So what you want to look for is whether they're searching for jobs, um, whether they're sending their resume home. You'd want to see, you know, sending contact details, that sort of thing, to say... This person's definitely exhibiting behaviors that mean that he's that mean that he may be on his way out, um, and then you do further investigations. How there. how do you determine that? So I send him my resume out like every six months just because I was working on it at home or something like that. It's not because I'm looking for a different job. It might be because I'm doing an update. I might be sending stuff home because I actually do did work on something like uh like just say a document i sent that home to a sure. personal address or something so you could put these correlations together but i'm sure most people do that in some sort of way what is what is how do you risk score that sure so you'd baseline it so if you send your resume home every six months then if i have enough data on you i should be able to say okay well this person sends home their resume significantly more than the average person the average person will decide they don't like a job, 
work on the resume, apply for jobs on their work computer because they don't think anyone's looking. And then when they get the resume finished or close to finished, they'll send it home for the day to work on it at home. Um, you will, we're never going to see people who write the resume and do job searching at home, right? So that's outside our purview. But if they do it on company property, we need to be able to see that. So who do you think is a higher risk uh, employee-wise? Do you think it's somebody who's a veteran that's been at a company for 10 years and is looking to move or someone, uh, you know, director, manager, or could it just be somebody straight out of college that, you know, is a high risk because maybe they've been there for six months and they're looking to move quickly and they're just going to take everything they can? Yeah, so it, it would depend on what access they have, right? So a manager would be expected to have access to more sensitive information. Um, they would also be able to have better contacts within the organization. So another thing to think about with flight risk is who they're going to take with them. So identifying the social network of the individual, um, especially for like hypothetically in a bank, you'd have traders that have client lists. You absolutely let them take everything they can, but not their client list, because that's where the, the trading floor makes their money. Um, so you'd want to tag all of that data and look for, you know, a certain number of account numbers going out at the same at one time. You'd want to look for identifying personal email addresses. So if you want to send home a shopping list, I'm cool with that. But everything should be monitored for high value targets. What is the limit? Like, when does it get too personal? So in our example, we have, you know, we discovered paulsemporium.com is owned by Paul Allen. Okay, then I could use that information to find more about Paul Allen online, find more about Paul's Emporium. I'm able to find, you know, personal contact information, which by, from then I can find out his home address. And, you know, I probably find that stuff out anyway, but more, more intimate details. When does it get a little bit too personal? So uh, the organization and audit compliance and HR actually decide this for each organization, or they should. Um, but typically, it is it has to be open to the public. Um, the activity has to be conducted on a um, company property or company time, um, and you have to give the employee the message that we monitor all traffic. There should be no expectation for of privacy. You mean uh, when at work? In like. Uh some sort of policy document that you should be reading when you get employed that no one reads or the flash document or flash screen every time you log into your computer okay yeah okay um, yeah, that, that no one also reads sure but like <laughs> ignorance of the law is not I, I'm, I know i know um you know you could go you can go deep in it right so if we wanted mm -hmm. to use who is to look up thank you guys if you want to look at who is to look up what personal websites they've registered. That is public domain. You can grab that. And then you say, okay, well, if, you know, I registered adamisawesome.com and then it starts a new track at adamisawesome.com, I should be able to alert on that immediately because that's publicly available and you shouldn't be going to your own website. And if you are, expect that to be monitored. When it gets weird is in the social network or the social media space. In which case, learn to lock down your profiles. So, Adam, when, when do you support insider release of information and not detecting <laughs> it? <laughs> um, I never support releasing uh, sensitive data. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let other people know that, Snowden. So, I go, if Adam, if I go to LinkedIn yep. every other day. Sure. Would you count that as an anomaly? No. And would I also... You, would you count going to LinkedIn, sending a message, and then sending a message through corporate email to a LinkedIn contact every other day? No. Because okay. you should be baseline against yourself, then baseline against your peers, and then baseline against the company as a whole. So you may be an outlier for your group, but uh, for an example, a recruiter, right? A recruiter would be on LinkedIn, on Dice, on Monster every day. And so they're not constantly in flight risk. That's just their job. Um, also, you could compare them against their peers. And if their peers, like if you're a manager who's hiring and all of your peers are hiring as well, then you would expect 
you would expect um, that traffic, and it wouldn't be an anomaly. You, you, you keep talking about baselining. Sure. How, how would one baseline an entire organization of 10, 20,000 people? How, how do you organize all that data? Yeah, so um, if we're going to use Splunk as the example for your SIM, um, what you'd want to see is I would keep a lookup table of, let's say, 300,000 people at the company, right? It's a large, large company. You would keep a lookup table that has the individual and the average total megabytes out um, for a day. And so you'd sample 30 days to get a clean sample. Um, divide the number of work days in that month, and you'd say this person has an average of 15 megabytes out, right? And so when they start showing up with 30 megabytes out, that might be significant, um, but it's probably not because what you want to look for is more than that, right? So they may be working for, um, on Tuesday, they work a lot harder than they do on Wednesday. Wednesday, they just watch YouTube. Um, how, how do you go that deep, though? How do you determine on days what, what people are supposed to be doing? Oh, it's just, so it's an aggregate table. Um, okay. So you use the lookup table that says employee number 12 has this, and then you run a regression or a saved report that would then say, show me anyone who's, standard devi who's two standard deviations over their average traffic. Um, and that's fairly trivial to do, even at that scale. Let's... Let's quickly jump off of how to detect and how do you how do you prevent insider threat? Do you do you have any suggestions for that? Sure. So um, one of the, the focuses of flight risk is they're a risk, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're leaving. It looks like it's that they're looking to leave. Um, so one way that should be adopted more is you reach out to their manager to try to find mitigation tactics, right? So why are they unhappy? Um, is is this salvageable? And before they have that conversation, obviously you put them on enhanced monitoring um, because you're telling them that you know that they're looking. Um, so they smoke out the rad situation. Um, but once they're enhanced monitoring, then the manager can reach out and say, hey, you're clearly not happy with this role. Let me help you. What are you unhappy with? Um, alternatively, just lock down all the computers like you would for any other DLP program. Um, so USB block or USBs are all blocked. Um, they can't go to uncategorized web proxy, um, limit the ability to send to external sources an email unless there's a business case. If you're not customer facing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, turn off social media and web mail on their proxy. Um, there's a lot of mitigation techniques that are just standard hygiene for inside of that. Adam, you're talking about a lot of things that I don't like. So if you start enabling all those things and disabling my access, yes, I might be a little bit unhappy with my current work situation. Sure. What's and you also the, might be more productive. What's the risk there? Uh, well, no, no, I won't be because I'll be looking for jobs. Sure. And that's fine, so, right? So... <laughs> If you want to browse Facebook all day, I don't want you working for my organization anyways. <laughs> a little bit less risky, but identifying activity that isn't work-related, yes. is that is that something that people want to know, like metrics for non-work-related activities? Is it even exciting? Is it is it really a threat? I mean, accessing those sites, right, it probably brings a threat of like drive-by malware or something like that. But like, is it something that insider threat teams want so that is not those the things that i listed are not part of the degree metrics okay so like audio video on on web sense categories or on blue categories is going to be your youtube right but you can do a subset and say disable comments on youtube which is going to be the risk um their ability to watch justin bieber videos all day at mm. work isn't prohibited by blocking um, web comment board or web boards or social media. Um, but then going to Facebook and being able to copy paste all of your important documents into a message to their 500 closest acquaintances is. 
Um, so if it presents a security, a real security threat, then I'm very draconian on it. If it's a productivity metrics, you're just out of your job. That's fine. We'll figure it out soon. Now, Adam, do you see a lot of companies realistically doing all of those things? Because that is a lot to deal with. It's not hard. Like, so if you know what you're trying to block, it's it's not hard to do if you have the right tools. Um, yeah, I mean, my my biggest thing is, I I mean. I go back and forth with the idea of blocking USBs or not. I think they definitely should be. And I think uh, the employer should supply USBs that are allowed to be used. But with companies that do travel all around the world and meet with a whole bunch of different people, I mean, USBs are the main way they communicate Access. or even, yep. you know, yeah. Just and, and even Gmail accounts back and forth from, you know, employee employee email to gmail out to the people they're working with that are just in other countries i mean I, you did say kind of do approvals for people and you know only let a small subset do it but i just feel like it's going to be very taxing to kind of go through the headache of figuring out who can and who can't so i i would actually argue the opposite for usb um i don't remember the last time i used a usb stick everything i do is stored in you know the mythical cloud Cloud. Cloud. Um, so blocking USB. Like a, nim- like a, a Nimbus? Or? Yes, a Cumulus wow. Cloud. <laughs> um, that's the secure kind. Um, so like USB blocks, it's hard to justify people doing USBs unless they give presentations commonly, right? So if you give presentations commonly, then you need to be able to plug it into the display at the front and give that person permissions but then log everything that they write or read from their drive. Um, and Bit9 can easily do this and, and keep it pretty pretty clean. Um, but you should not be able to have, like, realistically, the average office worker doesn't need a USB drive. I mean, where are they taking the rest of the data? They get one workstation and then they email everything whenever they use it. So, Adam, what, what's the uh, general maturity that you're seeing around the industry? For organizations that take insider threats seriously, um, it seems to be relatively high. I, I do think it's a very small percentage of companies as a whole take insider threat seriously and actually build it out separate from their DLP. It's usually a part of the DLP, which they share a lot of tools, but the thought behind it is very different. The DLP is... You know, make sure that we don't lose data. But they don't really know what data they're looking for, and they don't know how to find it, um, generally. Um, Insider Threat is trying to look at users rather than look at the data itself. So it's a different way of looking at it. Um, so so what, what, in, what industry do you think takes it the most serious, and what industry do you think doesn't oh, take it serious at all? So most serious is hands down um, banking. Anything in finance where there's a lot on the line where if there was a media leak, it would be significant to the company. Um, They have a lot on the line, so they're going to spend more on IT and they're going to buy every tool under the sun and two of some of them. Other industries like like auto industries, right? They want to protect their blueprints, but I don't know that they can lose a ton unless you know you're... Toyota and you knew that your brake pedal stuck and your gas pedal stuck. Um, so like media leaks would be a risk there, but insider threat wouldn't really be for the average person who's, you know, doing your tire change and using a Toyota computer. I know towards the beginning you mentioned the insiders, at least flight risk insiders don't typically drop malware or whatever. Right. But, but there's always the case of, malicious destruction occurring because someone does not like their workplace they leave a worm behind or they plan a time a logic bomb on on the server or something how do you how do you stop that embedded problems in the code is significantly hard to find um like that is the only thing you can really do there is qaqc um, and have pure checking of code. And even then, I haven't seen it done exceptionally well. Um, but 
for like people who are maliciously infecting their computer. Uh, you look at repeat offenders. So if your computer consistently gets, you know, bit nine carbon black flags on it, if it always has SEP issues, um, if it's constantly being rebuilt, then you're just trying to find iterations of code that can get past those controls. Um, cause you're not going to bring in the, you know, the magic bullet the first time you try. It's going to be, oh, this one didn't work. Okay, let me go find another one. And typically those are script kiddies. If they are really good at writing their own malware, they're probably going to beat you. What about insiders that don't use computers? Instead, bring them a baseball bat and start destroying stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that we could, we could find that in the logs. I mean, maybe like the, the aggressive talk, the aggressive language we could find. <laughs> Um, such as I'm going to bring a baseball back and bat and smash your computer. Um, okay. But that that's usually in corporate security and less in insider threat, even though the threat is inside the house. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's ThreatCast. If you're interested in more insider threat discussion, leave a comment. Uh, we're probably going to talk about it anyway in the future. So, you know, your, your comments are always welcome. Um, so, Mark, Adam, any any last comments? No, please read the article and, and comment below, though. It's been a and, while on it. And the article you can find on threatfix.com, another shameless plug. So until next time, this is Paul, Mark, and Adam for the Threatcast. Goodbye, everyone.